Good morning, everyone. Morning. My name is Tiffany. Uh, my husband, Elliot, and I, we have the great honor of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. Woo -woo! Uh, and it's always good to be with you on Sunday. I love, I love being with you, your faces and seeing you and praying for you. I was walking around this morning and I was like, uh, Jesus, you know, he talks to people. He does that. He still does that today. So I'm walking around and I know like just some things I've been praying for, for people. And I love when we get together on a Sunday, and we can just share that and, and what God is doing. There's something powerful that happens when you connect with other believers who are fighting for you and are praying for you. And you just, there's so much encouragement, uh, in, in coming together on Sunday. So I'm glad you're all here. Way to go. High five. Air high five. Um, so we're in a series called Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, and this is uh, week two, uh, Frequently Asked Questions. And this series is all about answering, just it's just like what it sounds like. Uh, we're, a we're answering some questions that we have been frequently asked about God, about Christianity, about church, about the Bible. Like, you name it, we're not going to answer all the questions because there's a thousand, you know. But we cherry-picked a few, and we're going we're gonna to present those to you. Uh, last week, Elliot, Pastor Elliot did a dynamic job. He did spiritual warfare, basically, are there spiritual things. And if you miss that, you can go back and you can catch it on YouTube or you can catch it on Facebook. Uh, I also want to just good morning to everybody who's tuning in online. We're so happy to have you with us as well. Church, could you, could you clap and welcome everybody <laughs> online? Way to go. Okay, so uh, this week, what we're going to talk about, I couldn't decide. There's titles. You know, we should title things or whatever. Um, and I couldn't decide if I should go with how do I know I, I am saved or what does it mean to be saved? Because it depends on what side of the spectrum you're on. If you're, uh, you know, you just came to church, somebody dragged you here, you don't know why you're here, you don't really want to be here, uh, then your, your question might be about salvation. What does that even mean? Uh, and then on the other side of the spectrum, if you've been coming to church for a while, you think you're a believer, you know, you, you raised your hand once, but then sometimes you have the question, you know, how but how do I know I'm saved? How do I know that worked? Uh, and so that's the question we're going to answer today. It's, it's about salvation. Um, and so what I want to say is that the beginning of salvation looks different for everyone. If you turn around and ask, like you, you, you turn around to your, the person next to you and you say, hey, you know, how did you get saved? What that looked like? And they'll tell you their story. And then you turn around to the person sitting on the other side of you and you ask them their story. Hey, what does salvation look like for you? What happened? They'll tell you a different story because it doesn't look the same for, for anybody, which I think is, is really cool. So everyone who has a relationship with Jesus um, has their own story about how they came to know him, how that happened in their life. Uh, some people, I've heard some dramatic stories. Some people have crazy dramatic stories uh, where it's like, they're, you know, I have, I have a lady friend. She was telling me about her story where she grew up and she kind of knew Jesus. She grew up in the South. So it was like, I mean, that's what you do. You go to church and you know Jesus. Uh, but in her teenage life, she was partying and just doing whatever she wanted, you know, clubs and bars and all the things. And then something happened in her life where she was kind of struggling and she said she was in the bathroom. I think she was getting ready to go out, you know. And all of a sudden, it was like she says the presence of, I don't know what that feels like, but the presence of God just like invaded the bathroom and she hit the floor and she was crying because God met her right where she was at in the bathroom. I'm like, that's crazy. And her life Life has never been the same since. And I don't mean in a weird, like, you know, like UFOs came and got her. But in a good way, she was completely transformed because God met her there. And like, that's crazy. So some people have dramatic stories, but then other people seem to have stories uh, that unfold over time. Like little by little, they felt like Jesus was pursuing them. They didn't know it then, but after the fact in telling the story. So it's like, you know, maybe it was a person who was raised in a family that knew Jesus. And so that young person went to church all the time and, like, knew about God and, and saw their parents. But their story of salvation is really just them identifying the point in time where Jesus was their Lord. Jesus was their Savior. So it's not crazy, emotional, or dramatic, but it's no less significant. No less significant. It's just a different story. Um, some people's stories are full of emotion and vivid imagery. And when they, like the story in the bathroom, when they tell their story, you can just, like... <gasps> Like you can just sense being there, you know what I mean? Like all that emotion, all that, all that, everything that God did, you can sense it. And then other times it's like, oh yeah, 
That just seems logical. That seems logical. You just kept making some good decisions, and you can still see Jesus. So my story, I'll tell you my story, not all of it, uh, but my story of coming to know Jesus, it was one of those boring ones that unfolded over time. <laughs> no, it's not boring. It's my story, and I love it. I love it. Um, I was one of the ones who grew up in church. My mom, I didn't grow up in church. I wasn't born in church. My parents came to church, (laughs) though. Every Sunday, I was the kid. My mom came to church every Sunday. And so if my mom was at church, we were there. And I'm not just talking about Sunday morning. I mean, my mom came Sunday morning. And then back then, they had Sunday night. So we were there Sunday night. And then they had Wednesday night. So we were there on Wednesday. Get this, they had Monday night prayer. We were there too. And then any other event, if the church had an event, if it was a cleaning party, my mom was there. And if my mom was there, me and my brother were there. We were always at church. Um, And so I remember believing in Jesus uh, when I was small. I just, I always knew who he was. Uh, I knew that Jesus was real. Um, I knew that God was real. I knew that there was a Jesus and that there was a God. Um, this, I have one part, there's one part of my story that's crazy. I was, uh, we lived in Manteca up until the age of four. So I was like three or four because we lived in Manteca. And we're, my mom is at the dining room table, which is on this side. And there's a hutch right here, which we still have in our dining room. If you walk into our house anyway, so there's a dining room table and there's a hutch and it's carpeted. It's a carpeted, uh, living or dining room. And this is like one of the very few memories I have from that age. (laughs) Uh, and my mom is uh, at the dining room table, and she's doing the bills, you know, the checkbook, and she's reconciling and doing all that stuff. And me and my brother, we have our toys out. I don't even know what we're playing with. And we're arguing. We keep fighting and arguing and not getting along. And my mom oh, repeatedly was like, just knock it off. Can you get along? Stop fighting. And, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, but then we kept, we'd fight over something else. We couldn't, we didn't know how to share, like, you know, toddlers or little people. That's what you do. And then all of a sudden... All of a sudden, out loud, I'm not kidding. I heard like the audible voice of the living God thunder in my dining room. And he said, obey your parents. And I was like, I literally stopped dead in my tracks. And I was like, looking around, you know, and my mom can't hear. My mom's deaf. So I'm like, did she hear that? You know, and then I don't even know if my brother heard it, but I did, you know, and so I'm thinking now after the fact, I'm thinking, did God really say something out loud? Or, you know, when you get a song stuck in your head and it's over and over and over, your brain actually thinks you're listening to music. Like, no, I'm not. Knock it off. Anyway, so I wonder if my brain just thought I heard it out loud or if God really thundered because it felt like the whole world heard it. <laughs> like now the whole world knows I'm disobeying my mom. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so that happened when I was, when I was small. Um, so, I, you know, I knew Jesus was real. I knew God was real. He was around. Uh, and it was at age 12. I went to an event, and it was there that I saw the power of Jesus presented. You know, guys were ripping phone books. It was called Radical Reality, I think, and they were talking about that guy recently just passed away uh, who did that. Um, I sad, right? Um, but he's with Jesus now, so that's better for him. Um, anyway, it was there, and so these guys and, and ladies were telling their stories about how, you know, they had broken families and drug addiction and all kinds of pain and just wanting something to change, wanting to see something different and not having the power to do it. And then they're talking about how they met Jesus, every single one of them, how they met Jesus. And I was like, that's the power of God. That's the, that's the God I want to serve. And so when I realized that that's who Jesus was, I was like, yes, this is for me. So my story is it unfolded over time, little by little, when I began to realize who God was. And I said, yes, I just kept saying yes. I just kept following him. And so, um, something clicked that day and I realized I could have my own relationship with him. So today I'm 31 years old um, and I've never walked away from Jesus. You know, I don't have a crazy story. (laughs) You can clap. (sighs) Yeah, okay. Uh, (laughs) I'm I'm bringing that up for a reason. I've never walked away from Jesus. I've always attended church. I never had a, a season where I walked away, where I backslid. Uh, and I've always loved to serve others, to be a part of the team, to give back and to serve other people. But I, and I'm telling you that because it seems like with my story, there should never have been a moment or a doubt in my mind that I wasn't saved. When you're looking on the outside, you're like, that girl's never had a question. She's always been confident. Maybe. You know, with my story, you hear uh, 
you know, you, we compare our stories with other people's stories. And so when you're hearing someone else's story, you're like, they don't struggle with the doubt. They never wonder whether God loves them because of their story. And so I'm saying that because I remember when I was a teenager, remember, I never walked away from Jesus. But when I was a teenager, uh, every Sunday in church, the invitation to give your life to Jesus happens. You know, that. What we, it's what we do. <laughs> but at the, at the end of every sermon, you know, we invite, and so the pastor would invite people to give their life to Jesus or to recommit their life to Jesus. And I remember when I was a teenager, um, I would question in that moment whether or not Jesus really knew me. And I would question if he really saw my life. Uh, or if I needed to raise my hand again, like, do you see me? Do you see me? Because I mean it. I mean it. You know what I mean? But I would question in the middle of the week, and then all that, that moment would come. I'm like, how do I know it worked, though? How, how, do I, how do I know it worked? And so it's a question that you may or may not ask out loud. How do I know I'm saved, or, or what does it mean to be saved? But I think every single person in some form or fashion has wrestled with that that question, or has had that thought. What does it even mean, and, and how do I know? Does, does God really see me? And so I'm going to do this in a point-by-point point thing because I think it's the easiest. So if you have, uh, when you walked in the door, you should have gotten a bulletin, and in the bulletin there's sermon notes. There are fill-in-the-blanks, so if you want to fill in the blanks and take notes, you can pull that out now. Uh, we're going to begin to open up the scriptures, so those will be on the screen. And you can also tune into to version. It's the Brown Bible app. If you have that app, you can pull it up and follow along on the events tab as well. Uh, and I like to take my digital notes. Every Sunday I take digital notes on the Version app, and then I can save them because I throw paper in the garbage. <laughs> I don't know about y'all. Okay, whatever. Uh, main points. Okay, so here we go. To begin, this is, this is the first thing I want to do. Um, first, I want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you uh, for your scripture. Lord, I thank you that you are alive and you still speak today. You're the creator of heaven and earth, and you know each and every single one of us. Whether or not we've given our life to you or we're still questioning and we, have, we really have no idea about this church thing, God, that you're still there, and that doesn't really matter to you as much as just knowing a person. And so, Father, I thank you for your spirit. I ask that you would come and you would minister to each and every single one of us. Father, that each person would be met right where they're at, and you would give them a word for today. Lord, that they can walk away with knowing that I've met with the living God and life is going to be okay because he's with me. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so to begin, what I, what I want to do is I think we should know what salvation is not. So let's talk about what it isn't. That's hard to say. Uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23 is where I'm going first. Uh, and there's, here's your first blank. Salvation is not being a good person. Salvation is not being a good person. So let's look at it from Scripture. Uh, Luke 18, 18 through 23, a certain ruler asked him, him being Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Eternal life is another way of saying salvation. What must I do to, to inherit salvation? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. So I'm going to stop here. It's that there is no such thing as being a good person without God. It's impossible if only God is good. And I want us to catch that because I have breezed by that so often. Why do you call me good? Because the, the, the question is eternal life. So we're looking for Jesus' answer about eternal life. But in the middle of that, Jesus gives a nugget and he says, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. And so I need us to know, we're, we're looking at it right now, being a good person is not a thing. <laughs> because Jesus says, no one's good, only God is. And so without God, no one can be good. Uh, and then he keeps going, he says, you know the commandments, because he was talking to a Jewish person. The Jewish person knew the Ten Commandments and all the commandments and all the laws. And so Jesus says to this guy, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. And so the guy says, well, all these things I've kept since I was a boy, he said. And so basically Jesus is telling, or this guy is telling Jesus, yeah, I'm a good person. I've kept all your commandments. And then Jesus says uh, in verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. 
So I want us to get this. Jesus did not disagree with the man. He didn't tell that man you're wrong. When he said, I've kept all these commandments, Jesus looked at the man and said, okay, that's true. Uh, basically, but yet Jesus went on to say that being a good person is not how you inherit eternal life or become saved. So it says in verse 23, when the man heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Now for that man, Jesus said, yeah, you've, you've done good things, but I need you to do this. If you want eternal life, this is what I need. This is what you need to do. Uh, and so when he says, when he heard that, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. I'm going to switch to the message version, and it says it like this. Um, this. This was the last thing the official expected to hear. He was very rich, and he became terribly sad because he was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. The message keeps going, and Jesus, seeing his reaction, said, do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? I'd say it's easier to thread a needle with a camel than to get a rich person into God's kingdom. So what I, I want to look at this because it, it seems at this point Jesus leveled with that man. Jesus wasn't heartless. What he saw was this man was brokenhearted. This man came to Jesus thinking, yeah, I've earned it. Yeah, I've been really good. Jesus is going to say, you've got eternal life. You are saved. You've got it all together. You're good. You're wealthy. You have everything you need. You're a good, nice person. And so that this guy is coming believing that he's done enough to be saved. And Jesus says, he doesn't disagree with the man. He looks at the man and says, yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're wealthy. Yeah, you've got a lot. You've got it together. But he says, Sell, get rid of your stuff. Let go of your stuff. Let go of the grip you have on your stuff and come follow me. And then you'll find life, is, is what he says. And when, when the man heard that, he got really sad because he was like, you mean all this hard work is in vain? All, all this work I've done, all, everything I've done, is, does it, does it, it's not worth it? And so Jesus, this is so cool. This is so cool. This is the God we serve. If you've given your life to Jesus, this is the God we serve. He, he gets down on that guy's level, and he was like, I know this is hard for you. I know this is hard because I see the work that you've done, and, and I see how much you have. And I'm not saying that it's easy, but if you want eternal life, then this is how you find it. And I think that's so cool because he wasn't harsh with the man. It was like, I feel for you. Jesus knew what he said was difficult. And he said, I feel for you. I, 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 see, I see it. Um, then um, it goes on to say, the, the people in the crowd ask, well, then who has any chance at all? You know, because if you don't have it all, to, I mean, who's going to get it in the kingdom? How's that? And then Jesus said, no chance at all. If you think you can pull it off by yourself, if you think you can pull it off by yourself, you have no chance. <laughs> he says, every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. That's so cool. That's so cool. So here it is. We want to talk about what salvation is not before we get into it. We cannot work our way into being saved. We can't. Uh, if you think you're good enough or you, if you think you have it all together or if you think you can do it, you'll miss it. You'll have a really good life. You'll have all this stuff, but you'll miss Jesus. Uh, so we need to trust that what God says is good, even if it's hard, even if it's hard, and go with that. Because here's the thing. If we go with what God says, we can trust that he'll do it. And that's, that's where we find life. So and I, here's something funny. In our world, good is relative. When you think I'm good enough, okay, let's just, let's just talk about it for a second. Because for some people, good enough is, you know, I wake up on time every day. I go to work on time every day. I put in my full, you know, eight hours, and I come home. And, I'm, you know, I'm doing good. I am a good person. And for someone else, good is I didn't murder anybody today. <laughs> I'm good. I didn't kill anybody. You know what I mean? Like, that is so broad. Your idea of good doesn't match your neighbor's idea of good. And so being a good person, what is that? Relative. Relative. Only God is good. And so our barometer of good is based on him. Because you didn't murder and you went to work on time. Like, okay. You know, I think I'd rather be with the person who only worries with being to work on time. <sighs> okay. 
That's funny. Okay. Next, that's segment number two. Next, I think we need to know where salvation begins. Salvation has a starting point. So let's talk about the starting point. Uh, salvation begins by believing that there is one God and that Jesus is his son who came and gave up his life for ours, defeating death so that we can be in rela right relationship with God now, right now, and forever. So when it talks about eternal life, how do I inherit eternal life? Eternal life means life that doesn't end with you. So it's life right now into the future, life right now into forever. That's, that, that's eternal life. So Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 is a popular scripture. It says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, this is the word saved. I, I think there's a definition up there for you. Saved, that word in the original language Greek means, it says sozo. Sozo. And that word means to deliver or protect either literally or figuratively. It means to heal, to preserve, to save, to do well, to be or to make whole. So you will be saved. Being saved is about more than just going to heaven when you die. You know, because we live our life and we think, oh, I'll just, you know, Jesus, right before I die, I'll go to heaven. You know what I mean? Like sometimes we live like that. Uh, but it's, it's about way more than going to heaven when you die. It's about right now. It's about healing and protection for your life right now. It's about being made whole right now. Uh, and so there's, there's more to God than the afterlife. You know, he's the right here, right now life. Because that word sozo, that word saved, means I want to do something in your life right now. Um, God intends to deliver and to protect you. God intends to heal you, to preserve you, to make you do well, and to have you be whole. God wants that for you. Uh, and then it goes on to say, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified I'm going to stop right there with that word justified. I am not going to pronounce it because I don't know how to. Don't speak Greek. No, I'm not even going to. Is it up on the screen? You try. Dia. Nope, not going to. Okay. Uh, but that word just, justified, what it means is to integrity, virtue, purity of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. So it, for it is with your heart that you believe and are made integrous. You are made virtuous. You are given purity. You are made right. You are given correctness of thinking and feeling and acting. With your heart, you, you do that when, when you profess Jesus. And then the scripture goes on to say, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Okay, so being saved, we'll talk about it. Being saved begins with, begins with a person stating out loud, out with your mouth, <laughs> with your mouth out loud. Because I think a lot of times I'm guilty. I think a lot of things. <laughs> I think a lot of things in my brain. But I'm like 50-50 eh, on whether or not I say a lot of things out loud. Uh, and so this, it says with the mouth. It doesn't say with your mind you profess. It doesn't say with your thoughts you profess. It says with your mouth. So, you know, we open our mouth and we profess that Jesus is Lord. So being saved begins with a person stating out loud that Jesus is Lord. So when I'm going through this, I'm like, what the heck does that mean? What do you mean Jesus is Lord? What is, is Lord? What is, <laughs> when you're a kid, you know, have you ever been, well, who was it? Somebody, you know, when you're a kid and you sing songs and you run words together because you, you haven't learned how to read yet and you don't know words. And so you make up things. <gasps> Pastor Amber, Pastor Amber, when she was a kid, there's a song that they used to sing. I'm just remembering it right now. Uh, and the song was something about the load I bear. Like, I'm, I'm bearing a heavy load, the load I bear. But she's little, and she lives in Lodi, and there's the load I bear. <laughs> so she thought in church they were singing about the load I bear. Isn't that funny? That's funny. That's funny. Okay. Anyway, Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? This Lord, it's uh, kir Kyrios probably said it wrong, uh, in the Greek. And it means supremacy, to be supreme in authority as a noun, to be a controller, by implication a master, 
or it's a respectful title, God, Lord, Master, Sir. So being saved with, uh, begins with a person, you or me, stating out loud that Jesus is supreme. Jesus is supreme in authority. Jesus is the controller. Jesus is the master. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, um, all things were created through him and by him, and there's nothing that exists that wasn't made by him, and all things hold together in him. He is supreme. Whether or not we think it, it is true. Scripture says all things were made by Jesus. And so when you state out loud, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is supreme, and then you believe in your heart, which is really your thoughts and your feelings. When you believe in your thoughts and your feelings that God raised Jesus from the dead, that's where salvation begins. Okay? So we've talked about what salvation isn't. Salvation is not being a good person. No one's good. And salvation has a starting place, and that's professing Jesus as Lord and believing that in your heart. Now let's talk about what salvation looks like. And this is where we're going to have some fun. Salvation looks like, here's your, here's your blank, God working in us. Salvation looks like God working in us in us. So salvation begins with that out loud confession of Jesus being the son of God who died for you. But that's just the beginning. And I think a lot of us stop there. We're like, woohoo! God's going to heal me. He's going to protect me. He's going to deliver me. He's going to save me. Awesome. Um, but that's, that's the first conversation that began the relationship. That's like, you know, if you, if you think that's, that's the end, is just that confession, that's like making a new friend and then never talking to him again. Like, you're not really a friend. You know, you met them and you said, you know, let's be besties, and then you never called them again. You're not, eh, it's not really a thing. Okay? Um, so after the confession, there's the rest of your life to live. If you've, if you've made the decision or you're considering the decision, uh, that's just the starting place. And then there's the whole rest of your life until the day you die uh, that's like God working in you. And that's what salvation looks like. Um, and here's the thing. Uh, your life should begin to look a little bit different because God should be working in you. So Philippians chapter 2, verses 12b through 13 says this. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I'm giving you a lot of definitions today, but that's because when I was reading, I was like, I'm a Christian who grew up in church. But when I'm looking at it with outside eyes, I'm like, what do you mean trembling? What do you mean fear and trembling? Am I supposed to be scared? <laughs> um, and so, for, but I'll keep going. To continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. We'll break that down in a minute. But trembling is tromos, and it literally means with fear and trembling. <laughs> okay. It's used this way. It's used to describe the anxiety. Anybody ever felt anxious about anything ever in your entire life? You know anxiety. Okay. It's used to describe the anxiety of one who distrusts his ability to completely meet all the requirements, but religiously does his utmost to fulfill his duty. Anybody ever been promoted? Anybody ever got a promotion at work or start a new job? And you had, there's a little bit of anxiety, like, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do this all the way. Like, I really want to do a good job, but I'm not sure if I have what it takes because I don't know everything yet. I've got a lot of learning to do. I've got a lot of growing to do. I've, you know what I mean? Like that, that new job experience where there's some anxiety and there's some pressure. And that's what that trembling is to describe the anxiety of when you distrust your ability to meet all the requirements because you know you don't know it all. But you're going to do your best anyway. You're going to give it all you got anyway. That's what it means. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I know I don't have all the answers, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do it, but I'm going to give it my best shot anyway. That's so good. That's so good because that makes it doable. That makes it not about perfection. It's just I'm going to give Jesus my best. I'm going to do my best. So to say it simply in a way that my brain can process easily is salvation looks like me having a respect for God because of who he is and what he has done, and then having an understanding way deep down inside of me that I will never be able to measure up to being good enough. But at the same time, believing and knowing that if I keep taking the next right step led by Jesus, that he's going to lead me to fulfill his good purpose. 
He's going to be faithful to do it. Him in me is what makes me good. That's what salvation looks like. Him in me makes me good. And so I thought it'd be fun to try and illustrate this principle. God working in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Because here's the thing, that looks different in every person. Um, but So let me, let me just think, no, not one person's journey or story is the same. And every person has a, has, has a starting place with Jesus that looks different than anybody else's starting place. And this is so cool. Um, it's, it's prompted by, by the Spirit into their, into their next step. So I'm just going to confess my own self. I'm a Christian forever. Okay, I've got some judgment issues, for real. Um, so as a, as a Christian, I'm talking to other Christians in the room, maybe you're like me, uh, where someone gets saved and you've got an idea of what their next step should be. Because oh, you've seen their life. You're like, man, you got to do this. You should start here. You got some problems. <laughs> um, okay, or here's, an, here's another one. Here's the opposite end of the spectrum. You're not a Christian. You're not a believer. You don't know. You don't care about church. That's fine. You don't care about Jesus. Okay. Um, but you look at it as a, a Christian person and you judge them. If you're a Christian, you should look like this. You're a Christian. Why are you doing this? And so we, we make judgments based on our idea of what a Christian should look like. Okay, and we determine if they're not taking that step, they're not saved. Or if they're not taking that step, they're not submitted to Jesus. And can I just caution all of us, there's only one Holy Spirit and you're not it. Oh, neither am I. I'm not anybody's Holy Spirit. There's only one. And I do absolutely believe that the Holy Spirit prompts people to, to, to minister to other people. But if Jesus, from the very heart of God, if Jesus hasn't told you to do, you know, Jesus hasn't, giving you a word for somebody, then keep your opinion to yourself. Because Jesus is, the scripture says, he will, he will prompt you to do things. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. When we first uh, give our life to Jesus, so this is us, this is us, this beautiful shiny pink tree. I'm tall enough. Um, nah. Okay, here it is. This is us. <laughs> You love my sound effects, I know. Okay, so when uh, we're walking around life, this is before we've given our life to Jesus. You know, we just, we live our own life and we look good. I mean, look how shiny I am. I got it all together. I got all the monies. Or I don't have all the monies, but I look good anyway. Because I got debt on my credit. No, just kidding, kidding. Now I'm getting too personal. Back up, back up. I look good. I look good. This is what we look like, Okay. And this is what happens. We walk around, we're super shiny, um, and then we give our, uh, we give our, there's fruit on here. This is fruit. Because th what is, uh, I, don't, I don't have the scripture for you, but there's a lot of them. And it talks about the fact that we produce fruit. We're, you know, we're trees, we're likened to trees, and we produce fruit. Now, we, it's either good fruit or bad fruit, because there's only two kinds of fruit. You know, you can't have mediocre, well, I can see have mediocre fruit. That's bad. That's not good. It's bad. Um, okay, so you have good fruit and you have bad fruit. If you're doing relatively good things, you know, we assume we're, I didn't murder today. I'm great. Okay? Um, but what happens, so we walk around we, and, we, and we've got our fruit and we think it looks good. But honestly, if we haven't given our life to Jesus, then most of the fruit that we're giving out is rotten. We're giving out rotten things. And we think, we think they look good, but let me, let me talk about it for a second because we think we look good. But have you ever, I'm going to get up in your business, I'm sorry. Um, when you're alone, you know, whether it's going to bed or, you know, you're, you, you live by yourself. I don't know. I have friends. Um, and there's, you know, you got nothing preoccupied. Some, you start to feel, you ever start to feel bad? Like you wish there was more or something starts eating at you, like maybe it is credit card debt and it starts eating up at you. You wish you didn't have it, but you don't know how to change your behavior and so you just live with, it feels like rotten fruit in your life. Um, but we just keep, we, we're so shiny, nobody knows that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we, we got it all together so nobody knows what our insides feel like. But most of the time when your insides start to feel yucky enough and you, you hear about Jesus, you're like, oh yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. I don't know what all that means, but I want to give my life to Jesus. And so what happens is when we make, sorry, I'll fix it. I'm breaking this. I, there were, I was instructed to pick this up by the bottom. And then I didn't. 
Oh, there it is. Oh, it fell over. Okay, it's going up. Okay, so when we give our life to Jesus, thank you. Give Katie a round of applause. My right, helper. Okay, so what happens is when we give our life to Jesus, um, this is what he says. I didn't put that scripture up there either. But he says, when you give your life to Jesus, you become a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, I'm making all things new. Behold, the new has come. Okay? And so we get, it's not as as shiny, but it's white, which means it's pure. He's made you new. He's made you good. Because when you made the confession, all of a sudden, God is in you, and if God is in you, you become good. And so this white is, you're not so shiny, but you're good. You're really good on the inside because Jesus is in you. What happens, though, is we don't know any better most of the time. And so we try and transfer things from our old life into our new life. And here's the thing. Okay, judgy people, because you're all judgy. I'm judgy, so you're judgy. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you're judging somebody based on what they are or are not doing. Okay? So let's just say, for example, uh, you you give your life to Jesus, and somewhat, I'll be the guy. I'll be the lady. And I'm going to judge you. And in my my own opinion, I think, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to offend anybody. Okay, but I think you need to stop this. That's what I think. You need to stop doing this. But here's what's happening. Jesus, the scripture says, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So I have an opinion on what I think you should change. But God over here is saying, you know, this is, this is from the old tree. This is from your old life. And he's, you're, you're going to put it on your new life. You're, you're about to do it in your new life and, and giving yourself to Jesus. And, and you feel like, you don't know why because nobody told you, but all of a sudden you feel like maybe you should get a new playlist on Spotify. Nobody told you that. But all of a sudden you're feeling a little funny about the, the music you're listening to. For no reason at all. No reason at all. But you decide, okay, I'm going to, okay, I'll try it. And so you throw that old playlist in the garbage and you put on a new playlist. Okay, that's God working in you to will and to act according to fulfill his good purpose in your life. Now, I asked around this week because I was like, hey, do you have any stories about when you first gave your life to Jesus, like some things that started happening in you? And this is really cool. This is, this is what salvation looks like, and it's different for every single person because we have an opinion on what God should do in a person's life, but God knows what he's doing. And so I was asking around, and one person said, um, one person said this. They used to listen, or they used to read their, their, uh, their horoscopes. They used to read their horoscopes. This was hanging on their life, and, you know, they open up their horoscopes. Uh, and they said they were, they were vacuuming one day in their house, and they were like, all of a sudden, no one told them, but there was just this impression that, hey, maybe I shouldn't read horoscopes anymore. They didn't know why. Nobody told them. But they just decided to not do that anymore. And so instead of transferring, this is yucky. It is so rotten. Uh, Instead of transferring that rotten fruit to their life, they were like, okay, I'm not going to do that. And instead, they started picking up their Bible. Instead of doing their their daily horoscope, they did their daily Bible reading and said, nobody told them to do that. It was just this this idea in their brain. And then, you know, later we find out in Scripture, I'm not, I don't know if you'll hang that, um, Later we find out in scripture that we know if we read our horoscopes, it opens the door to spiritual attack. You know, last week, Pastor Elliot was talking about spiritual forces in in the world, and horoscopes are an open door to that. And so Jesus, in that person, nobody told him to stop reading their horoscopes. But Jesus said, I want to protect you. I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. And they didn't know that, but all they did was follow that prompt that weird prompt to not, to not do horoscopes anymore. And what, what God was doing, God knew what he was doing. He was closing the door on spiritual attack in that person's life. And all they did was follow the prompt because God was working them to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Here's another one. I'm doing real simple things because when we first give our life to Jesus, that's what he does. A lot of times we want to see deep work. Like, I want you to stop doing this. 
You know what I mean? Because you're a Christian now. Uh, and God is like, how about, this is from the old tree, how about you just put a little more clothes on? You know? Anybody? Um, where you feel like maybe that mini skirt and that low cut shirt just ain't cutting it no more. Like Jesus wants to do something. Nobody told you that. Nobody said, but something happened in your own personal life and you're like, Ugh. Okay, this feels funny. It doesn't feel like it used to. It doesn't feel as good anymore, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to try something new. And so you throw that fruit away, and, you know, you go shopping. And, and you get some new clothes, and you decide to dress differently. And these are really simple things, but that is what salvation is, God working in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And sometimes it's simple things like change your playlist or, hey, why don't you dress differently? Or, hey, you know, I had another friend said that she, uh, she just music. There was another person that burned all their CDs. No one told them to do that. They just felt, they just didn't seem good anymore, and so they lit them on fire. There was another friend who had tarot cards, and was like, I don't feel good about these anymore, and got rid of them. And it was God working in a person. So if you've ever had a weird, it's not weird, but a prompting to do something, and you've given your life to Jesus, it's God working in you to fulfill his good purpose in your life. And it starts simple. Most of the time it starts simple. And then it grows into the deeper things like, hey, let's work on your forgiveness level. You know what I mean? Like, let it go. Let it go with your spouse. Let it go with whatever. Um, Or, you know, it moves into your attitude. (laughs) You know, as you grow, he's like, can you just be nice? Can you be nicer? Can Here's another thing. Can you own your stuff? Can you own your stuff? Let's deal with your pride. But he doesn't start there. Most of the time, God doesn't start there in a person. He starts with little things. And as we do those little things, it grows more and more and more. And it gets easier to follow. Because when we do those small things, all of a sudden, life starts to feel better. And when life starts to feel better, we keep moving in that direction. And God is faithful to will and to act. And so that's what salvation is. Salvation looks like God working in us. And so here it is. If we're slow to respond to the working of God in our life, we will be slow to see the good things he has. If we're slow to follow the prompts, the slower we will be to to look like a mature tree. It's only got two things on it. (laughs) It'll feel like two people. Ah, But as you get more mature, as you follow those promptings, you'll have more fruit on your life. You'll have more good fruit to give away. You'll be a mature tree. You know what I mean? Like when you walk by a cherry tree that's full of cherries, you're like, yes, I want that tree in my backyard. But a cherry that's got, you know, a tree that's one, I don't know, yucky tree. Okay, so this is what it is. Being saved, in a simple simple thing, being saved means that we're signing up for a lifelong journey with God of repentance and exchanges that will bring about his good purpose in our life. It's a journey of repentance and exchanges that bring about his good purpose purpose. And I'm saying repentance because repentance means, what that really means is I I repent for my sin, if you heard it in scripture. It means I'm going to change my mind. I'm changing my mind and I'm walking in a different direction. That's what it means to to repent. And so when we give our life to Jesus and we start to see his way of doing things, we're like, oh yeah, that's better. Or even if it's not, even if we don't think it's better, yeah, I'm going to change my mind anyway. Father, I repent for thinking that this was good when you said this was good. So I'm going to try it your way anyway. That's repentance. So it's a lifelong journey of repentance and walking in humility. So here we're going to just do some action steps. Uh, number one, how do I become saved? If you're in the room and you want, or you're listening online and you I want, I want to be saved. I want God working in my life. We already talked about it. It's Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So real simple, say out loud, Jesus is Lord. And then number two, believe God raised him from the dead. And that's the starting point. That's the starting point for becoming saved. And this is why I think uh, when, it, when I came to the end of the sermon and people, you know, the invitation comes, would you like to give your life to Jesus? That doesn't feel like I did anything. It almost doesn't feel like I did anything because most of the time it happens inside. And so it can feel like, but that, that's it. It's as simple as that. 
declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, your thoughts and your feelings, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that's the beginning of your salvation. So number two is how do I stay saved? Okay, yeah, that's great. I confess. I've been coming to church every Sunday for like five weeks. How do I stay saved? How do I know I'm still saved? That, that's a question. Here it is. It's simple. Respond to the next right step. Whatever your next right step is, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then trust that God is already working in you. He began it right away. So if you felt a nudge to change the way you dress or you felt a nudge to get a new playlist on Spotify or you felt a nudge to stop watching a certain TV show or here's something good. You felt a nudge to, to tell somebody else about what Jesus is doing. Maybe you don't even call it Jesus. You're just like, hey, man, I've, this is weird, but I've been going to church for a, like five weeks and something different's happening in my life, and I think you should come with me. You know, I really think something would happen. If, if you feel like you're prompted to do that, that's it. Do it. It's the next right step. And it's not simple. I mean, it's not profound. It's not huge. It's not deep. It's just the next right step because God is working in you to fulfill his good purpose. Uh, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And so the third thing is, what do I do if I feel like I've walked away? Uh, this looks like um, you, you know, here it is. You confess that you've ignored those nudges of God working in you, and you repent for doing it your way instead of his way. So let's say when you first gave your life to Jesus, if you're in the room and you've given your life to Jesus, and at first you were following those, those prompts, you were responding to those nudges, and then all of a sudden you've kind of backed off. You're like, no, man, I got this. That was good for a minute, but I got, I'm, I'm going to do it my own way. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. And so you still know Jesus. You made this confession way back here, but I'm doing my own thing. I got God. Yeah, God knows me. You know what I mean? But you're not. <laughs> you're not really following any nudges anymore. At that point, God's not working in your life. And so you just, this is, it's simple. It takes work on your part because you got to confess. Here's, here's the big thing. You got to humble yourself and say, I've been doing it my way instead of your way. I've been doing it my way instead of your way. Will you forgive me? I want to come back. I want your prompting. I want you working in my life again because I want your protection. I want your healing. That felt better. That felt better, and I want that. Repentance will, again, open the door of your heart to receive the working of God in your life. There's Luke uh, chapter 3, verse 8 out of the NIV. It says, Jesus is talking to religious people, and he says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Changing your mind. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. That scripture, Jesus was talking to religious people who thought they were saved. He was talking to religious people who thought they were saved. And they thought they were saved because we have Abraham as our father. I'm good. What they were saying is I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I got this, God. I'm good enough. I got this. I'm saved. I don't need you, Jesus. That's what, that's what they're saying. And Jesus says, I tell you out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham who will love me. And so here's just a paraphrase. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that you're good enough and revert back to thinking you don't need Jesus. That's because it's so easy. It's so, I'm good. I got God. I'm good. I can do whatever I want. I can make my own decisions. But if we're not walking with Jesus and God's not working in us, then we're going to start to produce that rotten, yucky. That orange was nasty. Ugh. You don't want, we don't, I don't, we don't want that. <laughs> okay, so that's simple. That was answering the questions about salvation. So now I want everybody to go ahead. I'm going to do the thing, you know, where I'm going to make you all feel weird about whether or not you're saved. <laughs> go ahead and close your, close your eyes and bow your heads. Uh, not because it's special, but it's just a personal time with Jesus where you guys can, can talk to him privately and not have any distractions. So I just want to pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're good. Lord, I thank you that you give us salvation. Lord, that it's possible for you to be working in our life right now, for you to be bringing protection and healing and salvation, for you to be making me whole, for you to be making me good. Lord, I thank you that, that you give us that. 
And Father, I ask right now that there would be, there would be humility in this room. Father, that your spirit would, would over, overshadow us and rest on us with the spirit of humility. Lord, in the spirit of truth, knowing that if we're in the room and we've given our life to Jesus, Father, that we would have a confidence that you see my life, you know my life, and I'm grateful that you're working in my life. But still have an attitude of repentance that says, God, because you're working in my life, will you point out the next right step for me? Will you point out what's yucky so that I can get rid of it and get some good fruit in my life? Lord, I thank you that you're so faithful to do that and you are doing that. You are moving people to their next right step. Whether it's something personal in their life, an action step like the TV or the radio or something like that, or if it's an attitude or a forgiveness. Lord, that you're prompting people because you're working in them. I thank you for that, Father. And I do want to ask with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you've never made that decision, you never started that conversation, then I do want to give you that opportunity. And I want to talk to two groups of people at the same time. So it's you. If you've never started that conversation where you said, Jesus is Lord, and I believe that God raised him from the dead, then I want to, I want to invite you to begin that conversation. And then the other group is if you're in the room and you feel like you walked away, you gave your life to Jesus, you were making decisions, and then you did your own thing, and you're like, man, I'm, I don't feel you working in my life, and I want that. Then I want to give you an opportunity to just come home. So if that's you, if you're in either one of those two camps on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand, and I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. We're going to pray that prayer so that God can be working in your life. Again, so on the count of three, one, two, three. If that's you, just shoot your hand up in the air. I see you, I see you, I see you, I see you. Amen. God is so good. So everybody in the room, it's never bad to say this prayer every time. Why? Because every day we walk away. <laughs> every day we need repentance. And so, Father God, I thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe that he is Lord, that he is supreme. I thank you for raising him from the dead, that I can have life right now. I thank you for your healing. I thank you for your protection. I thank you for you working in me. Guard and protect me, Jesus. And fill me with your spirit. Amen. Can we just clap our hands?